Okay, are we on? We're on. We're on. Oh, wow. <laughs> well, you know, this is my gorgeous friend, Brayden. And, you know, it's all about, wow, your life, you know. And I know that you said to me that if you could make a positive influence on someone out there, that would be a great thing for you by telling yeah. your story. I've gone through a lot of stuff. Yeah. I, don't, I was going to say shit. Am I allowed to say that? Yeah, you can say good? shit. Yeah. I mean, this is what it's about. <laughs> Some people may take offence to it, but this is about being real and raw yeah. and, and you know, it's not about rules and regulations. It's okay. about being who you are hmm. and, you know, portraying your story as you do um, just in a, a normal conversation. Hmm. You know, it's not about, have you got the question sheet? Have you got this? You yeah. know, what time do we do that? What time is this? It's not about that at all. It's about being on the couch and just having a cup of coffee. Yeah, coffee. yeah and chatting yeah. about life and, and you know, mm. being relaxed about it. And I know it's a big thing for you, like, because you're only 27. Mm. And what you've I lived I feel from, older in here. <laughs> yeah, but I just wonder how, how on earth did you fit in everything that you have lived in such a short time? You know, to me, it's just crazy. I know people have said that to me when I was like 17, mm. you know, but um, I finally found someone that's very similar in that way, that you just pound everything into 24 hours that would normally yeah. take someone else three days, mm. you know. So let's go like way back to when you were a young child. Okay. And let's talk about when did you feel like you were different from everybody else? Or you didn't feel different, maybe? No, I did. Um, primary school, even. Like, back in primary school, year... Well, probably all the way through primary school, but year four and five is where it really kicked in. So did so you that think was... that there was something like... Was it something where you thought to yourself, you know, I feel female? I mean, were you up to really even thinking that way? Or were you up to, like, I feel like I have this desire to... I don't know. How does someone think? Because I'm not gay. No. I don't know how. What you? <laughs> no, how you think. not at all. Um, how do you no, think? People do interpret it that way. Um, I had confusion, so I, well, I watched all the boys in school, not because I was attracted to them at that point, because I was in, I was probably year four, probably nine or something. Um, but they're all sporty, and I thought, oh, that's what I have to do. And I was always into the arts and the music and. I was a teacher's pet in primary school, so I was, oh, I was getting along with all the older, wiser people, and I just had no interest in any of the, the general chit chat. So you thought yourself on. that you were just different in that way because at the you time, were yeah. sporty, you were more so artistic. All my, all my friends were girls that were into art and um, socialising, so I had a lot of female friends through primary school. Didn't work too well for me in primary school because back then, you, if you weren't playing sport or you weren't kicking a ball around or you're into art, you were already stereotyped straight away. Oh, you must be, you know, into boys because you don't play sport. Um, but a lot of my friends were female, and I didn't think much of it other than the fact that I didn't like doing what the guys were doing. I liked doing what I liked doing, and if that's what I wanted to do, I did it. Um, so is that how you thought? Like, you you no, didn't let yeah. it worry you that way? Did you kind I of I felt like... isolated and alone. Like, yeah. I definitely felt like I was the odd kid out. And when I had birthday parties at home with... Friends and that it was hard when I had a birthday list and mum said invite friends. It was hard working out who was a friend and who was just there. Like, mm. I didn't really understand the difference between a friend and someone that was just there because they got they got something out of it. Did you have um, one like one really close friend that you connected yeah, in with? In primary school, I had yeah. Her, her name was I can name names with friends. I'll leave the other names. Name with friends. Name with friends. Friends are good. <laughs> Um, but yeah, her name was uh, Jackie, so Jackie and I, we got along like a house on fire in primary school and still talk today. That's, like, that's fantastic, isn't it? She lives, I think she lives in the state now. And so you, you've been through your whole journey with her, having that solid friend. Oh yeah, she's always oh, been there. Oh, see, that's awesome. One of those friends that you pick the phone up to or you say, it's just like yesterday you had a conversation. And she's still into her Pokemon cards and things like that from way back then, right? Um, yeah, and it was just, yeah, we still talked, I spoke to her a couple of weeks ago, and it was just crazy how much she's gone through and changed. And we've had that sort of similarity, and like we ask each other questions, oh, I don't do that because I went through this. And it's, mm. Yeah, we've been there, but not as much as we used to when we were younger. But I'd say she's probably one of the, the long standing friends I've got. And then into high school, when things got a bit more 
you know, as you get older, because I went from a public school by choice into a private school, because I wanted to go where the duckies were in the, in the pond, I thought, oh, I'll go there because I like the ducks. Mum's always pointed that story out to me. Um, <laughs> about the school that had the ducks in the pond. Speaking of mum, mum's yeah. with us today in the audience. Now, there is a chair there you can sit down so you can be nice and comfortable, darling. I, you know, I just thought I'd... Yeah, we won't see you getting your coffee. It's all right. Like, <laughs> <laughs> this is the real world of live media. Like, you know, every sound that goes on in the background, we all hear it as we experienced on Wednesday night yeah. with Darling Vince and his upside down screen and everything. But oh. that's what this is about. This is about being live and raw and making mm. mistakes and, you know, we are who we are, right? So primary school is a good friend. Mm -hmm. High school had another good friend, her name was Laura, and again, that if, if I was straight, I probably would have ended up with her. Like, I think that's one thing that family and Laura and I have both agreed on, that if I was straight, we would have married and had kids and it would have been a thing. So you knew then that you were not straight? Yeah, but I didn't know what that meant. Um, I knew I was artistic and I had a lot of female friends and I just got along with people that were not boisterous about it you know, oh, I'm going to do this, like, I'm not that way inclined. So a lot of my friends were female, and into high school, um, had a lot of female friends again, and in that school, I went to a private school that was um, supportive of whatever you did within reason, because uh, it did get dark towards the end, but we'll touch on that bit, and then we'll move mm. forward from it. But, um, yeah, no, Laura was there and stuck with me for year 7 to year 12 all the way through. We dated in year 10 and I think we got as close as to holding hands and then when it came to locking lips, we just, you know, like, <laughs> just we couldn't do it. So, <laughs> so, it never happened. How old were you when you had your first encounter? Same Female. sex encounter. Oh, same sex encounter. After Laura. Yeah, so, and, and Laura says, oh, I'm the one that made you gay, and I'm like, no, it wasn't you. <laughs> so, <laughs> I was already there. I was like, we never even screwed, like, we didn't even get that far. We wanted to, we talked about it, dating beyond the point of just chit-chatting and catching up with each other, anything beyond hands that made me uncomfortable, and I didn't want to say it because I didn't want to hurt her, but I didn't know how to do that because mm. we were friends, really good friends. Um, and you've had a very, like, because I know your parents. Mm. And to me, like, that has been a very positive impact on your life to have supportive parents yeah. and beautiful yeah. family behind you in that way. That and I thought everyone had that. So being gay in high school and, like, I had great friends in high school. My family have always been supportive and of what I did and I just took that for granted. And I'm guilty of doing that. Um, big time. Uh, and I make that realisation more and more as I get older that when you see kids walking down the street with their parents and they're yelling at them or like I did get yelled at, I was a brat, I was a fucking terrible child when I got older. Um, <laughs> so, and I'm going to that. There. <laughs> <laughs> but, um, yeah. I think we all were. But yeah, we all tried to challenge You know, I think when you, it, it, there's something different about you as an individual, you know, that's just what it happens because we have this inner frustration mm. because we're not being our true self. No. You know, we're always like trying to be like what we're meant to be like mm. and what's acceptable in society. And you gravitate to like the friends I made, they were all different. But the ones that I had friends growing up, I didn't even know what the, who the fuck I was, what I wanted to do. So I knew I was arty and that wasn't appreciated by the general consensus that we're male or, you know, straight domi dominating lifestyles. Mm. Um, when I got into high school, I was into arts. I was, everything became the Braden show in high school. It was, that's what the teachers called it. Um, we had creative arts night, it was theatre, drama, music. I did fucking everything. I was in a band, I was in three different bands. I did signing choir in primary school, which then turned to me singing. Um, but clarinet was the first thing I ever did, and that all followed me through high school. So what other instruments do you play? Just vocals now. Just vocals. Clarinet's but... going to a box. I couldn't tell you where it is. I think it's... It's either at my folks' place or in storage. I haven't. It's like you're so, you're so musically inclined that way, and charismatic, which is the character that mm. formed um, for you in your stage plays, and that is a drag queen. Like, yeah. And I have seen those shows, and I've got to tell you, like I know that I did some consulting on your hairstyle once, and I'm pretty sure it was that, it was a mohawk when we first I'm met. I'm pretty sure it made a difference. Yeah, <laughs> Mum's in the background, like. You know? But I think going back to the, the family thing in high school, more so touching on, I guess, the coming out component. Um, 
before you dive into the drag stuff because that's fun. That yeah, fun. I know. It's... We'll get past the dark stuff. High school was awful. High school got great because I got got to do what I wanted. It was a school that allowed that within reason. Once I, I accepted my sexuality and realised that it was in a weird coming out way where parents weren't ready to handle it at the time and I certainly wasn't ready to accept it. I started dating someone that was around the same age as me. He was a free-spirited, hippie kind of guy. And I gravitated towards that because it was different to everyone else I'd met. And no one knew about that? And mm, I did. My parents didn't. I, <laughs> I ended up one night taking the trash out, decided that I would jump in a taxi and go to this guy's house, pack my school uniform and all this shit, um, and went to his house. Mum and Dad went to bed and I'm like, oh, I'm kind of bed tired. They had no idea I left the house. Um, I went to his house and we, he stuck me into his house and then he took the doorknob off the door so his parents didn't know him, guest over, and then he drove me to school the next day. And that's when I had to wear a scarf and covered my neck. And school said that's not part of the uniform and I took it off and had a hickey on my neck and it was pink and purple. And then school sent me to the office because my parents work out where I was and then it was a got home from school three hour or no how long was it? Give me a number. He picked you up? Mum picked me up. I was at school waiting. Waiting when I got there because they Because he promised me he would go to school. Yeah. And, and I he guess, did. I did go to school. The next day I said I sent her a text, where are you? I'm fine, I'm safe, I'm at a friend's house, I'll be at school the next day and that was me jumping at an opportunity to identify who I was because I didn't know. And that gave me an opportunity to run with it, which is something I do a lot more now than what I ever did before. Um, ran with it, experimented, and went back to school, got home, and the comment that sticks in my head is, when I had the heat on my neck, I made up all these different so stories. Serious, yeah. What is the thing on your neck? There was a first inquiry a I got from my folks, and I'm like, oh, it's a bruise, I must have fallen over, or hit my neck on something and... And we as adults know what they look like, right? Yeah, oh, I didn't know that. <laughs> no, so... <laughs> well, what did I say? It was a... It um, was, I keep thinking it's a tree. You, That's, no, it wasn't. you walked into a cupboard. I walked into a cupboard? With your neck? With my neck. And Mum mm, said, well, that's tricky. very interesting. Did it have lips? Oh, wow. <laughs> so it went for a while. <laughs> really? It was, did it have lips? <laughs> so, I mean, you know, like, <clears> in that way, yeah. you're blessed that you have that connection with your family like that because I know as a parent you know these things you just mm. know them and it's like we're just ever so sitting back waiting for you guys to have that realization too yeah and um you know and being accepting of the fact so I mean you kind of you've been you're lying to yourself in a way but you don't really know what what I it is that you are. Say. Like, but, at the time, media was saying being gay was like, mm. if, if you were gay, you covered yourself in glitter, you read up Oxford Street in Sydney and you fucked anything that moved. That is what media said. And knowing that I was attracted to I think men... that's a beep. That situation then was beep. Yeah. Sorry. That's yeah. all right. But, um, <laughs> no, you should be saying something. <laughs> I'll try. Um, we're trying to be really light-hearted yeah. here because I know the places that we're going with this yeah. conversation is going to be a lot I'm trying to, darker. To juice it up a little yeah. bit. Um, it, yeah, people thought you ran up and down the street and just, you know, anything was fair game. Any hole was gold sort of concept for the gay community. And people had this fear of AIDS and HIV and all these diseases and media really pushed on that. Did that affect you, like, through time that you... Oh, God, yeah. Li yes. Like, living with that... Knowing that I was gay at the time, once I came out to my parents, it, it took a couple of months to process, I think, at home, because I, once I came out, I was like, okay, the cat's out of the bag. Now what? For me. Not for my folks. The folks took a while to process it, but mum came around at one point and said, I loved you before you came out. I loved you when you were born. Why the hell does it have to change how I feel about you now? Mm. And she said, I loved you when, you, when I had you. That doesn't change. Mm -hmm. So all this, basically all this stuff that's going on on TV and all the things that people are saying, my son hasn't changed. Mm. He might, he it's might still so true. Yeah, he still loves me. Love yeah. me too. <laughs> um, but again, going through the media of it at the time, this was 2008, 2009, so that's when they were a bit heavier on the Mardi Gras stuff. Yeah, very frightening time. Very pushy because it was just around the heaviness of trying to get equality through and, mm. and all that. So they were very heavy. Um, yeah, I didn't know what to think. I was frightened because I'm like, okay, now that it's now that I'm that, does that mean I'm going to get HIV one day? Like, 
all those health concerns went through my mind. So did you go and talk to someone or a doctor or anything about that situation? No. no. So you never got any Once assistance. I accepted my sexuality and the, got, the cat got let out of the bag again at school, because I just mm. got sick of being bullied about you're into arts, you're into drama, you don't play football, the boys play soccer, they all get pissed on the way. Like, I wasn't into any of that. Um, it, it ended up being that I just needed to say something. I just got sick of Izzy, 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 and I just had to mm. fucking go, you know what? I am. Deal with it. Like, that's me. I've told my parents it's out. Once I did that, the school made it quite difficult towards the end of high school. It was my last yeah. two years of schooling. I got Bible bashed by the high school. I was sent to the shrinks office every morning because they believed I was possessed by the devil and that if they prayed it out of me hard enough, I'd be straight because that's not what God wants. And going to a school which accepted and loved me for all the artistic stuff I did, which they used to promote the crap out of the school now, like now school, our school's successful, this is where Brayden mm. is now, he's done this, he's done that. Um, there's still that element of, yeah, but if only people knew that what they put, the bureaucracy and the stuff I went through in that school, on top of all the amazing stuff I got to do, Mm. Um, was still there, was still an element of, yeah, you're great, but, and going through that, knowing, well, if, I'm always thought, well, God loves me for who I am, I wouldn't say I'm religious now, I'm not, I'm very, whatever, wherever the world takes me, but mm. at the time, it was very, God loves me for me, and people are saying, people that are in religious authority are saying, you can't be you. It was difficult. Mm. It, and going home, my parents loved me, supported me no matter what. Going to school, friends were there. Some of them had a few friends in high school, but then the rest of the cohort in school was very, mm, that's that gay boy. Did it so, make you want to, like, just stop your education altogether? Did you I, ever think that? I had moments through high school where I wanted to be, I wanted to end it. I remember there were a few dark times when I was just... What, end your life? Yeah. I, I had some awful moments and... And it wasn't because of my parents, and it wasn't because they were always there. It was the notion that I've realised now, is once I left home, once high school was over, it was that thing of, right, when I'm home, got support, got family, they're there, everyone loves me, because it's family, that you get mm. used to that. Um, which is why I say I take it for granted, because when I walked out the door, when the family's not there... You haven't got that support, you're there? on your own. Yeah. Who's there? And if the whole world is saying, you're gay and you don't fit in and that's not normal and your world is at the time high school and your HSC and all that mm. sort of stuff and who what people think about you not your parents it was daunting and I was very overwhelmed with how I felt and how people made me felt and oh this person thinks this of me so I'm going to change myself I ended up becoming a chameleon because and I forgot who I was which led me into being an escort it really it pushed me into all these different territories where I ended up <clears throat> falling into friendship circles with older people um, that were older than me but I thought were wiser because I didn't know who I was but I was saying I was wrong. So did you so, feel like, yeah because I mean I'm trying to get myself into that you know little piece of your life too. Yeah. So you know availing yourself to other men as an escort, mm. was that like your safe haven because you accepted who you were then? Yeah. And you were like, even though falsely loved, you felt loved in that control, area? Or was it, was, it was a controlled situation. So my identity crisis, because I didn't fit in at school, had a lot of female friends, didn't really fit in. I started working in a cinema, met some gay people that worked there and got introduced to the gay clubs of Sydney. And I found my sense of identity through being in control of who I engaged with, had friends that were escorts and it kind of introduced, it was never forced, it was me going, I don't know who the fuck I am, so give me a go, I'll crack mm -hmm. into this and see, is this me? Um, so I ended up doing escorting behind the scenes, <laughs> folks didn't know about this, they do now, before me, before this is taking place, but I, I dabbled and went out every weekend and hung out with drag queens and drug dealers and just, I had no idea who I was. Are you saying your mum's just found this out right now? No, no, she knows. Oh, okay. She doesn't like it. But no, well, none of us like it, but that is a reality. That's the truth, isn't it? Mm. That's, and for you to sit here and tell my viewers, like your, you know, secrets, basically. Because yeah. you do tend to keep those sort of things as a secret. 
you know, I mean, I just think that is just such an amazing thing that you are sharing that because I know there'd be people sitting out there right now watching this show mm. that are into that identity situation mm. right now and wondering, and maybe they've already stepped into that realm. Mm. It's very easy to step into being gay because mostly society, even though we've got marriage equality now, which is a blessing, but there's still minority groups and society groups out there or even parents, which is hard for me to process mm. because I have family that love me no matter what and it's unconditional. There's no, oh, well, we love you, but you're gay, so don't bring it home. I've never had that. Mm. And I hear of people that have that. And I, it's hard for me to process, but I know that in people on the other end of this camera, they mm. have families that go, oh, you can't get out. Like, kids get thrown out for this, and or they fall into, like, this. And we know of someone that, in that situation. We don't mm. mention names or anything, but I know yeah. when I first met you, that situation, that there was a young man that was attached to you at that time. And his, yeah, he went through a lot. Yeah, mm. his parents wouldn't have anything to do with him, and so much so as being in the same class as his sister, mm. and she wouldn't even acknowledge him. No. The whole like, family. I, I could get, I, I just can't get that. But you know, I'm not here to stand in judgment of anyone. That's not what I'm about. You know, I'm about telling a story. So, mm. in order to help others, that's what it, it's all about for me. Yeah. And I think with the escorting thing, it was an identity crisis for me. It was very much, how do I become me? So I, yeah, fast tracked. I, I had no, had lots of crazy friends. Were friends with them. Had well, what were you then? 17, barely 18. Wow! I think the first time I went into a gay bar, I wasn't even legal, but I got in because the person that I went with was a drag performer at Stonewall in Sydney, so I got in at the time and met a lot of amazing, were who they were and, and knew it, and it was inspiring mm. to be around people that I'm gay, and if people have a problem with that, inside these four walls, we can be who we are without restriction, and I just felt at calm and peace with that mm -hmm. and then walking outside the clubs and on up to the I was like, oh, okay, now can I be like that? Um, but I met people and the people I met were escorts and drag queens and nightclub managers and drug dealers and that didn't come to later. But um, the, yeah, the so escorting thing was, it was dark, but I felt in control of identifying myself and through other gay men I got a chance to meet that were all different through the escorting stuff. I found myself at the inner way. I was like, I can't accept this as me, and I'm, yeah, I'm meeting people with different opinions, and occasionally I might have to sleep with them. It was my job, I earned money. It was, it was easy to put money. <laughs> Better money working in retail than hospitality, trust me. I guess uh, like there's got to be a light at the end of every tunnel, right? right? Yeah. <laughs> so. Oh, and you know, but at the same time I was working at KFC, and I swear at some point I was like, how is he affording <laughs> money going out all the time? His salary at KFC was shit, because it was. Um, but it was identity, and I found my identity, which is a, probably an odd way to do it, but I found it through escorting, through meeting other gay men that had life experience, either the same age, older, dabbled in different worlds that were scarier than my own, and yeah, it was... So did that stuttering. lead into the drug use? Like, did that lead into mm -hmm. that situation for you? How no. did that part of your life start? That started through through an ex. Um, I had lots of friends, so during the escorting experience, I ran into different people that had become contacts, and they had stayed friends for a while. Um, the the contacts I made, some of them I kept, some of them I didn't. Some I'd go out on a weekend, and they'd always be there, a few drinks, catch up, may end up at their house. Um, it that led into a friendship that was six to seven years. It, it went on before I moved to Newcastle. So I lived in Sydney, moved to Newcastle for uni. And that person had been there throughout that, even during the time that I had met the younger guy that had his family and all that sort of mm -hmm. stuff that we just talked about. Um, he was always there on the back burner, and I thought maybe that was the one that got away. And so when I finished my university degree here in Newcastle, I... So what did you do at uni? Marketing. Okay, so Bachelor of Business and Marketing. Did so, hotel hey. industry in Sydney and then moved to Newcastle and went... And we're going to talk about that because we're going to lead into the business that you're in now, yeah. your own business. So um, so then we've, so you've up to that stage then. Mm. So of course, you know, that lifestyle leads into drugs and drug use and because mm. that's what I want to touch on. Yeah. Um, so 
how did that happen for you? Were you the one that wasn't really getting into it much and sitting back watching it? Or? Um, there were people, when I was escorting, there were people that, um, that did drugs and I never participated. They were always like, are oh, you going to get high with us? And I'm like, no, no, I can get high off your personality. You know, I can match that. I don't need to participate. Mm. Um, so I became familiar with different chemicals and what they did and how they affected people. Never touched them. It was when I um, met person X, we'll call. Yes. Because uh, I don't want to, I'm trying not to slip up with names because I just don't no. want to do that. Um, but person X um, was a friend for many years and I was always there at the time and I had met them through escorting and then they became a friendship. We ended up in a relationship together and that's where the empathetic side of me took over because they were a drug user and in order to understand where I fit in in that world there came a point where I felt I had to try it not because I was forced it was no force for me it was more so in my headspace how if this person relies on using this stuff what do they get from it that I'm not giving them as a, as a mm, what's the experience yeah. yeah and I and I've always been that way I try everything once yeah um and so I tried it to understand it to understand them that just opened up a floodgate to make it acceptable and oh, not for me but for the other person um which then opened up oh caveat of yeah worms can of worms for that to spiral to a point where drug use became daily um for three years in sydney uh living in living in bondi love lovely area for three years of drug use that I never thought I'd ever touch. It was the one thing that I never thought I would fall into <laughs> using ice of all of all drugs. Like all drugs are bad. But ice. But mm. you do read a lot into it and having experienced methamphetamine or ice or shard or whatever keywords people use to de describe it, crack, which is now ice these days. Um, I never thought I would land in using that because of all these posters and the you know pictures in the bus stop saying you know, it comes in a dunny and it, it doesn't but, yeah, yeah. but you know uh, the, I've seen how it's made and the posters are more scarier than truth but the truth of it from the emotional and spiritual and so did it really get a grip on you well yeah it, not to the capacity that I thought it would coming out of it yeah um, reflecting on it now who I became using that drug I don't recognise. I have no idea who that person is. It was me, yes, but it changed me in a way that I wasn't aware of. Because um, I was using ice and liquid ecstasy, which is known as GHB or GBL or any of those other acronyms that are out there, which you drink it and it makes you all fluffy and lovey-dovey and anything you touch you want to hump. Like it was that mm. sort of chemical and when you mix it with ice, it, it's intensified and it lasts longer. And, in a relationship that became very drug fueled, all my relationship was based on was what the drug made me feel, and I thought that that was my partner and love. So for the three years I was stuck thinking that when I use the drugs, I'm on the same level with my partner and we love each other for who we are, but it was the drugs driving that relationship. Mm. And I never made awareness of that until the last minute. And that's when I woke up from it. It was like a, a dream. That, what was that time like for you? The like, three you know, or in Sydney? Or? No, I mean, just waking up from that and saying, what made you do the okay about face? Not going there anymore, not taking drugs. Like, what? how did that happen? Like, yeah, it was a combination of different events. Because in Sydney, Sydney's very different to Newcastle environment and it's very different to, to Melbourne even. Um, the Sydney experience I had was very club club days. It was trance parties and dance parties and sex parties and he's a harness and he's a collar. Like I was full on into yes and M. Still M. <laughs> Still love my leather. No secrets here. Um, but <laughs> I love all that stuff. Like not not to the extent the Fifty Shades of Grey movies go because that's not real. Don't mm. watch the movies, don't read the book because I lived it. And those movies are bullshit. <laughs> it's a good movie, but 
it's not real. Uh, the reality that those movies and books miss out on is the emotional, mental trauma that it causes. Um, the drug use was triggered by narcissism. I never knew what that word meant mm. until I went through that relationship. The drugs drove that relationship and the realisation I made at a certain point was where person X made statements that I knew in my heart weren't true but throughout the relationship I was told they were and there came a certain point where something came up and I decided at this point in time to go you know what my heart's telling me that I shouldn't agree with this so I intentionally agreed I lied for the first time in mm. that in that relationship I lied to myself and to my partner at the time and said you know what, you are right about this situation at the time that we were talking about. And the response that came back to me was, don't you feel better? Now I knew in myself that what I agreed to at that time in that particular conversation, it already, it made me feel like it chills talking about it. I'm already like, ugh, about it because it's, it's disgusting that people can do that to you. Um, but it got to a point where that feeling of, I got a minute. I know that I shouldn't have agreed to what I just said there, and I know I don't believe that. Shit, this person's been guide, misguiding me the whole way through. And so it was like a little light glow moment. It was it? like, it was like everything faded out and like, yeah. Just, and I was like, ooh. And that's when I got scared and I was frightened, but at the time I was stuck. Like I was in a situation where the relationship had gone into a point where it was really no, a point of no return. And I was stuck. I had just lost my job at the time and I was in a relationship that was very controlling and I was scared to say anything. So I reached out at one point during that relationship when I, when I had that light bulb moment to ACON, so AIDS Council of New South Wales, and I had a psychologist. Person X thought I was going because I was having problems with myself. So I made them mm. believe that mm. problems I had with myself or because of them um, and the drugs and the impact it had on me. So I went to a counsellor and I asked these questions and I said, I'm having these feelings and it's being triggered by what I'm doing. I started using drugs because I wanted to be on the same page as my partner, which I, you should never do. And I, I'm guilty of doing that. If I go back just a bit before I continue with this, in primary school, like I said, in high school, I changed myself to suit the people I was with. Mm. I never knew who I was. And the whole time I went through all that escorting stuff, I found myself, I accepted myself, then I did some changes, I had moved to Newcastle for studies, I ended up in a relationship that was dark, and during the course of that relationship, I lost myself again, and had no idea that that was happening to me, until that light bulb moment, and I went, who the hell is Brayden? Mm. And that scared me, to the point of how do, how do I get out of here? And oh, I had moved all my stuff in my whole life was Sydney, my whole life was Bondi, I was stuck with person X and it was drug connected. Like mm. I took the drugs to be happy because the drugs made me happy. It just shut my mind off from thinking all these awful things. And I had so many near death experiences in the lead up to the light bulb moment that I should have been a wake up call for me to pull the plug. Like I ended up in St Vincent's Hospital, drug overdosed. I had accidentally picked up glass, like a glass of soft drink thinking, oh, it's my drink and had too much G in it and I ended up in the hospital almost dead for three minutes while they tried to revive me. I had no idea I died. And that light bulb moment, it, when I made the emotional realisation, not the physical one mm. from the drug use, but the light bulb moment of who the frick am I, I realised I had to escape. And the light bulb moment led to moving to Melbourne, and which is the best, sad, because my parents are in, <laughs> in Sydney. Mm -hmm. All my friends here are in New South Wales, even Newcastle, <laughs> where you are. Um, and that's all right, because we've got a place to stay now when we go to Melbourne. Yeah. <laughs> We're happy with that. Yeah. yeah. So we're pulling a gym. <laughs> but, um, yeah, no, the light bulb moment led to moving to Melbourne, and we tried in that relationship I tried so hard to change that person you can't change and I learned you cannot change people 
which is an oxymoron in itself because I change myself to mm. suit other people. Um, which has caused so many problems in my life from doing things I'm not happy about because I changed myself so much that I had aggravated people or done things that I shouldn't have done that I just want to move away from. And it's made me what some would call um, an ugly mug in some industries. And it's not because I intentionally did anything. It was because at the time I was so affected by what I'd gone through, I wasn't aware that mm. I had done anything that had hurt other people let alone myself. And so in that relationship, I decided to make changes for them and go, we're gonna move. We're gonna move from all this stuff and start fresh. Um, they agreed to go along with that. We relocated. The relationship started to feel like it was getting better. My parents were there, we moved stuff into storage. It felt like things had changed, that first and next was changing. Um, all they did was change their mind and never tell me because by the time we got to Melbourne and found a place together, they fell off the bandwagon. Their drug addiction had corrupted their brain to the point where they became zombified. They were on too many antidepressant drugs I never knew they were on. Um, which led to a second light bulb moment of, I'm trapped. I'm in a house where I'm not an Elise. Mm. I'm not an Elise. I don't have keys. I can't leave unless they leave. And you're away from your family. I'm away from my family. I've just relocated to another city. All my stuff is in storage. And it was a lot to take on because I moved to Melbourne thinking this is a new beginning. I've always wanted to be in Melbourne. I just knew when I went there on holidays, I felt a connection to Melbourne. Mm. Um, so when the decision came to make something known to person X that I'm in a relationship with you and I feel like I'm on a pedestal, I feel like I, you only want me when you want to take me off that shelf because that's how far the relationship had gone. And in that moment, it became violent, which was the, the second, third light bulb moment for me where I knew I should have left when the first light bulb went off, mm. but I couldn't, I was stuck. Um, in my head, I thought I was stuck, I don't know. I've got a really supportive family. I could have reached out to me any time and moved, I'm sure. Mm. But at the time, I wanted things to work with someone that I thought was Mr. Right. Um, because I think, you know, that in that situation, you're craving for love, even though you've got the most beautiful family and you've got all the lovely friends and yeah. whatever. It's the intimacy, it's the beautiful, it's love, as in love, as in a relationship mm. that you crave for. And you think sometimes, you know, I don't know about you, but I know that sometimes you'll go, oh, well, you know, oh, well, that's happened, but, you know, that's okay because, mm. oh, you know, that's all, all right. right. <laughs> but, you know, that's, that's like, oh, I can handle that or... You know, maybe I'm asking too much. Yeah, yeah, I'm asking too much, and or I want someone to be li oh, the way that I want them. Mm. You know, and you know that's just and toying you think, with your own oh, self. Maybe I should compromise. So you yeah. think that that's compromising with, with people that say they're gonna, they understand how you're feeling and they're gonna change, and then, but I never knew the line in the sand where you go, if the person's not gonna make changes that I've made for them, where do I draw the line and go? This is all single sided, and I didn't know where that line was, so I've gone mm. well and truly beyond it. And this is all new too for you. Yeah. Like the whole, your whole relationship situation is yeah. all new because but you're still exciting. finding brain. It was exciting. Oh, no, 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 no. Exciting. Well, what I well, maybe now, well, maybe, <laughs> maybe now you can sit back and say yeah. it was exciting. I look back at it now and go, there are things I did in that relationship that were exciting. I would not say it was a blessing. It was no. definitely a curse. And oh. I mean, and I know just some nights when I've had conversations with you. Mm. I don't know what else to call, so I, but, I ran you on my, I don't know what I'm doing. I know. Um, yeah, my headspace was awful, and the bit we've skipped is that the darkest point in that was where I went through what I never thought would happen to me, and that was a rape situation with someone that had basically chewed up all my trust and all of my hope and faith in humanity because I put it all into that relationship mm. and then to have that happen at the pinnacle moment of the third light bulb that I should have listened to the first one <laughs> and two more after um, became became that it became intensively abusive like I go into detail about what happened but I can like it was it was it was full on from someone that I thought never would do that to me for that to see them get up and just lose their shit and just 
lunge at me at the point in time I just said to them, because they woke up that day, I remember it's clear as day what happened to me that day, it was, I feel like I'm on a pedestal because I made this statement, I'm like, I, I can't cope with this situation, I'm on a, I feel like I'm on a shelf, I don't have keys, I'm not on the lease, we moved together and they couldn't handle it, and like, enough's enough, I'm done, and it just triggered from just that simple, who am I to you now that we've done this together because we moved together. Which is a reasonable conversation and we never had that conversation at all and we just felt there was a time to do that because it was our first week in the property together and we just started setting up as a home um, which turned into assault because it was a simple question of where did he go now? And it turned into them not being able to handle the fact that they've made that change as well away from all their friends, the lures of the drugs and the sex, drugs, rock and roll culture of Sydney and moving to a new city themselves, it turned into a rape thing of assault, which it ended up being so heated that it was pinned on the floor, it was bashing the shit out of me to trying to throw me out of the apartment because they just had enough of the relationship, but it was a relationship and a decision we made together for each other. So a decision that was made together got broken mm. three quarters of the way through. And yeah, it was an intensive assault that I never thought I'd be exposed to things that I'd be exposed to. Ended up in Monash Health. I discovered I there was a high poten potential I would have been exposed to HIV. Um, so all of that going through my head for, for three months was intense. And getting over the actual physical At the rate. same time of not knowing, am I going to come out of this sexually unscathed? Because I was bashed, bruised, beaten physically and emotionally and mentally tortured. And it was that light bulb moment of now I'm out of this 50 shades of real grey or black as I'll call it because it was, mm. it was coming out of the real thing of it. And I once I was out of that the split second that door slammed in that scenario after I was assaulted, bashed up, raped, kicked out, all in that sequence. After they had dusted their hands off and went, job done, because that's the last thing I heard out of that person after they had assaulted me and then threw me out. I could hear birds, I could hear traffic lights. It was like the roller coaster had stopped and someone hit play. And that's when I completely just broke because I realised how far gone I had gone in that self-discovery and the darkness of it all without knowing. Because once I've come out of that place, even though I felt safe up until that point, and even though for three months I suffered from wanting to go back, which I didn't realise was a thing, mm. um, I didn't realise I had that and for three months I thought no this person will change and it was me being so caught up in it all that I expected love to still be there. So it really tore me up for the three months leading up to that, like health wise medication. The um, What happened on that like you know okay let's just talk yeah. immediately after the act right and you're now you've been thrown out of the apartment. Yeah. Standing in the hallway with Standing all Standing in the hallway with all your bags. Mm. And you're suffering from the rape. Mm. And you're staying... What? Because I'm just trying to think, you know, and I have been in a situation like that, but it's always... Um, it's always interesting to me that what do you think that split second after? Like, what is it that you do next? What was the very first thing that you did in that situation? I felt like I breathed for the first Like it was all over? Like for the first time I felt like I could exhale and then I felt lost. Like my first thought at the time was I'm lost. I am in a new, like my, it was just a flood of thoughts in a new city. Got two suitcases and a duffel bag because it's all I had at the time because all my stuff was still in Sydney. Two suitcases, a duffel bag, me standing in the hallway, bashed, bruised blood. Feel it with someone else's fluids. 
Work that out for yourself. Um, thinking, what am I? It was, it was that. I had a thought of just... Fro I felt frozen. I felt like I was stuck to the floor. Where I was standing, I'm like, do I run? Do I pick up the phone? I never, not a single thought crossed my mind to call my folks. I didn't even contact you. No one knew at that moment what had happened because I didn't know what to do. I'd never been in a situation like that before. I was in shock. And for the first couple of days that followed that even, I still didn't know what to do. I didn't know where to go, who to see, who to talk to. I was very... But did you, like, did you... Did you go straight to hospital? Did you go to the police station? Did you go to refuge? Did you ring someone? Did I, you... I first reached out... Well, I tried reaching out to the person that assaulted me, thinking that that was a smart move. That turned into just silence and ignorance. I had nowhere to go, so I jumped on Facebook of all places, and at the time I had learned about these different pages you could go on to find a house. Um, I went on so you're thinking about a roof over my head, not what I went through. Yeah, I'm thinking I need somewhere safe, because I felt safe with that person, and then all of a sudden I felt... Even though you were living... Like now, surely you see, now the oh, way you're living, yeah, <laughs> was yeah. not safe at all. No, I went from 65 kilos to 40 or nearly 37 kilos at one point in that relationship and I thought that that was fine. It wasn't concerning me because the drugs were keeping me healthy in my head. I was fine, I'm not dead yet, I'm still eating, oh, okay. Yeah, I'm, I'm happy, fine. I'm happy. Yeah, I'm, yeah. Happy. I'm happy, singular. That false, yeah, false. Yes, yeah. and it was coming out of that and stopping the drugs as I stopped the drugs three months before moving. I was already mm. off that roller coaster because it was a decision that I'd made with them. But I, yeah, no, I first thought it was find a roof. I didn't, I didn't know how to handle this. Me and vulnerability are not friends. Um, I have always struggled with vulnerability. My first jump with vulnerability, any sense of feeling lost or isolated or alone, even if I'm confronted with I've done something wrong and someone says, you've done something wrong and I know that I might have done something because I like to say might, right? Because I don't know how to say yes, I did do <laughs> something wrong. I say, maybe I did. And it's, pure, it's not because I'm denying it. I honestly have no sense of vulnerability. So when I'm vulnerable, I immediately attack, and it's just because my immediate response is flight. Fight or flight, and mm. I don't fight mm. for anyone, for shit. No, no. Yeah, it, you're in a fight. It's not gloves. Yeah. <laughs> or no gloves. If I get broken knuckles in the process, so be it. Because mm. um, I'm defending myself because I had my family support always and friends that I met along the way, but in the real world, it was me. Because I put mm. myself through all the hard yards of working out who the hell I am, and it was me that had to defend themselves. I didn't want to bring any of that home. Mm. My home was my safe space. So, I, I see. <laughs> yeah. Wow. So you said <laughs> that. Yeah, I know. I'm just picturing this. I'm picturing you in the hallway, the lobby of this mm -hmm. place, with your bags, and obviously how vulnerable you are at that stage. And you've gone on Facebook to look for a house. I went on Facebook and posted photos. Because I didn't know who to, who to go, I didn't know anyone in Melbourne, so I posted photos of what happened. Um, and straight away I got an inbox message of complete random, because I didn't realise my Facebook settings were public, so the little global icon in the world came up, so everyone, everyone that saw it saw it, friends or not. Um, but thankfully that was and it. And it led to a message that came from someone saying, hi, we work for an organisation that helps people in these situations. Oh, wow. Messages. Thank you, Facebook. Messages. And um, I'll help you. Her name was Lucy uh, from a company called Queer Space. Now in Sydney. Queer Space. Queer Space. <laughs> in Sydney, organisations. has a ring to it. <laughs> organisations like this in Sydney exist. Mm. I'm very jaded because of my experience in the gay scene. I don't believe that there's a, there's a lot of organisations that say they're here for us. You really need to do research because there's people in them that don't really care as much mm. as what the organisations say they do. Acon's there, yep, it's there. There's a lot of people in there that really shouldn't be in there. 
Um, but I guess that's about connection too. Correct. It's yeah. about who you connect with because I know... Like, I've met a lot of people in that organisation just even without naming names that really should be looked into because not their past but who they are now working in organisations. Mm -hmm. To me it would be a conflict mm -hmm. to helping someone out of something. Cause I think they get the hidden message. They there. might be adding to those scenarios. Yes. Yeah. Um, and even with this organisation that reached out to help me at the time, it came later that there were people in there that were undermining the help I was getting. But the help at the time, this woman from Queer Space, again, Lucy, completely unrelated from anyone I went through, which was amazing, because I had no faith in anyone at that time. I was busted. Um, I reached out on Facebook because I thought, well, what else do I do? Um, there's more people there. I don't have to make thousands of phone calls. I can just cook and maybe something will come. Lucy reached out and turned up to the building that day. Wow, and come and helped you. And um, sat me down in the lobby and we had a chat and I broke down and bawled my eyes out and went, blah, 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 like I'm doing his. Thank you, Lucy. <laughs> I hope um, you get to see this one day. Yeah. And she walked me through things, took me to a hotel. They covered it, the company covered it. So Queer Space covered the cost and had a chat and I just worked with an organisation that was there to help, so to speak. Um, I, it was good at the start. Um, once you once you learn how far you can go with an organisation like that, it's good to pull the plug before they get a chance to do it to you. So then that kind of makes you feel jaded about your experience. I just had that. Mm. Um, but there are organisations, Queer Space is one of them. I can't fault them from what they did for me at the start because I was lost. I was ready to commit suicide. Like, but I'm, I have to, it takes me a while to process it because I was vulnerable. Mm. Um, you asked me, how did I feel at that door moment? I'm done. Hold my breath and just, like, if I don't know who I am anymore and I could be chewed up and spat out by someone that trusted me, loved me, supported me, said they were there for me, and then make me feel like that, how the hell am I going to feel like that again? And You never thought you'd be in the spot that you are right now. Mm. No, and in that moment in the hallway, I'm just remembering back to it now because I had to go back and then come back a bit. Um, she helped me realise that, or Lucy helped me realise that I can move on from that and that what I was feeling was normal. So I just felt that wasn't normal, if you want to mm. end it. Um, and yeah, vulnerability hit the roof and me and vulnerable don't work well together. Uh, so it turned into me wanting to end everything right then and there and it took weeks of, but they were in, they were very persistent. They rang me every day, they met me every day, they kept me in a hotel safe and away from what happened and police got involved and took my t-shirt that had been ripped from the front and asked if I wanted to collect that the other way because I was just not going to go get the shirt, I don't want the shirt. <laughs> I keep to keep keep it. Keep it. Um, come to Moorabbin and pick up your shirt. No, <laughs> too far away. It's not worth it. So I mean, that led to a police investigation. It led to a police investigation that looked into what happened, and a lot of evidence was given, and I mean a lot of the shirt, DNA, bloods, photos, scar marks. Take every every photo. There's even a scar on my arm. She can't say on there, but that little bit there is a constant reminder because that's where my bracelet got stuck. At the time of when I was thrown to the floor and all that, there's marks on me that um, I was going, oh, that's right, that, that was from that. Um, the police were involved and um, did their research and I ended up moving out of emergency housing to find another property to live in and then that ended and I had to find somewhere else and trying to find my footing after going through something where I had got so used to different people and coming out of a drug fueled relationship, I gravitated towards people that were similar, again not the smartest idea or decision to make, but I thought it was, I'm thinking, mm. if I can't judge real people, because I don't know how to handle real people at the time, because I was so busted, I just went, mm, okay, drug user, drug dealer, escort, okay. I can handle that person, I know their pattern, I know their patter, I know what they do with it, I know how they sell it, I know how they behave. I will gravitate towards people, so at the time I didn't know how to hang around anyone, so I gravitated towards people like that, which landed me in more hot water than good, and then mm. ended up being worse. 
and police were investigating everything along the way through all of that. So the police were there looking into person X and what happened to me. Um, and it went on for a year because I only really got the answer to this situation in the last couple of weeks. And what's the answer to the situation? The answer to what I went through with the drugs and everything was that there was inconclusive evidence, evidence which meant that it can be contested in court, so therefore it's plausible deniability that it even happened, which after all the psychology I've gone through with counsellors, psychologists, police, queer space advisors, self-help, the on-blue phone line conversations, everything's been documented, photos of everything and stat decks and... In, and the, the amount of inconclusive inconclusive evidence. outcome evidence. to what I came through though, but like all the evidence and all the written stuff and all the photos and all the proof, video files of person X using chemicals and videos of me and person X, so at the time I had no filter, I was videos of me having sex with person X that ended up online, like there was, and with chemicals in the background. Um, there was, there's so much stuff there that indicates there was abuse. Police dropped it and said inconclusive can be contested. Um, that so is hard think, to handle. <laughs> well, that is hard to handle, but I guess too you've got to look at where you've come to now and how far you are. Mm. You know, and even just looking at you, how fantastic you look and healthy and just, and you even sound better. Like you just sound different and just, you know, it's just such an amazing. I just look at you and I just think, I don't know. <laughs> mm. It's a lot. And even when I talk it, talk this to people, because you met me before all this. I know. You were there when I had a shitty mohawk wig. Yeah. <laughs> Walking down, was it, Fashions of Hamilton or what that street parade was. And we're, we're, we're talking about here, like we're, we're talking about the alter ego. And mm. I'm sorry, I'm just a little bit upset. Yeah. Um, Right. Oh no. You're gonna be okay. Yeah. <laughs> I'm gonna be okay no matter what. But anyway, mm. it's really heart wrenching stuff, Braden. Because you know, I care about you. No, no. Thank you. I'm just so happy that you are where you are right now. Out of all that. Because he goes on. I know. Because there's that, that there's that time frame of what I went through to figuring out who the hell I was after all that. Mm. I had to keep a lot of other stuff running to keep myself That's financially right. stable. And a lot of it trickled into stuff I'm dealing with now. So even though that part of my life is, that chapter's closed and this new one's opened, that we'll touch on. Um, there's still elements of people there that are ruffled by who I was, not who I am. And mm. Even I have a hard time going, oh, was I like that? Did I do stuff like that? Because I'm not aware of what I and that's did. That's like a, a whole different life, isn't it? Yeah, it's like, there's, there's photos it's like watching a phone. movie. There's photos in my phone and I'm like... Did I really do that? I, I wore that? <laughs> <laughs> you did. I wore, I wore, I wore that. But only you could get away with it, right? <laughs> but there's, there's photos like that in my phone and I'm like, I talked like that? Like... Jesus, <laughs> it's like even now I look at my own. And I mean, myself. I look at, like we're saying, the Mohawk. So I'm just saying that Brayden has an amazing show and charismatic is the character. And Drag Queen Show is just, look, if ever you're out and about and you see it advertised anywhere, you have got to go and see the show. Like just the outfits, the singing, just, oh, everything um, is just amazing. So um, do yourself a favour and make sure you go and say Or actually go on, um, you've got a Facebook page, Charismatic? Yeah, go to the, go to the website um, or just Charismatic. It's not spelt how you, you think. Um, I did I did tag Charismatic yeah. here. So you'll see the correct spelling when just you look type, at the tag. Just type yeah. .com.au after the name and you'll find my website. Yeah. There's photos, there's videos, there's Stray's Got Talent on there. Like... Yeah, Stray's Got Talent. Hello. Yeah. yeah, that was amazing, wasn't it? That was a great yeah. little thing. like. Uh, yeah, did that, did that really happened. It's kind of it's kind of a blur too. It's like all this other crap went on, and then there was this, <laughs> and then there was that, and then like you with your um your degree, like how you ever lived through all that and got the degree and still maintain that whole level of 
um, commitment to that too is pretty incredible. I, I think, think it's willpower. Like I never thought I had it. And people keep saying willpower, willpower. I'm like, mm, it's just how I am. Mm. So, so now with your own business, mm. the name of your business is Sweet Release. Sweet <laughs> Release. Like, don't you just love that? <laughs> I just think you. And you know what? When you think about it, Sweet Release. That's exactly what it is. It's about releasing the old and, you know, everything's mm. sweet now. And that was, that's exactly, it wasn't how the name came about. Like the oh, story. come on, we could just tell them but that. But you could know. say that. Like, if the, story, yeah. this, the, the name came up because I went through that drug past. So crack pipes are made by a brand called Sweet Puff. So the name Sweet Release came from that. Um, but now, yes, <laughs> what you've said, yes, it's releasing. Let's go from here. Let's go on in yeah, yeah, yeah. I think that's um, pretty cool. The design of the logo and everything, if you put the word and the logo together, you're like, oh, yeah, it's shaped like a pipe, but that's past. <laughs> so that's past. That's the past. We've got to look um, at the new now. The new is, sweet yeah, release. And like a, lot of, a lot of clients come to me now for marketing, advertising, and branding that are lost and lost how I was, even. Um, like, I used to help restaurants and hotels with marketing. Even when I was in Newcastle, I helped a few restaurants here mm. with marketing and advertising and did a few things for you with, mm. with your shop. And um, it was just still trying to find my footing then. Now I do it for an industry that's least understood. It's the adult industry of all things. And most people, when they go, oh, but she worked for all these different restaurants and hotels and stuff like that. How the hell do you know anything about the adult industry? And it's kind of like now you know. Oh, now you know my story. Yeah, <laughs> of course I do. Um, I have a huge connection to this industry because it's how I found myself, mm. and I've seen a lot of people and met a lot of people that were trying to find themselves, and they come to my business to find the identity they want to have for themselves, so they can have successful businesses, whether they're an escort or an adult retail shop, or some interesting brand that does leather stuff that I'm into. But, um, you know, it's, you know... I think you've made that <laughs> But, um... That's all right. That's about the flamboyant side yeah. of this young and man. Like, you know, we've got to take all that along with yeah, it, you. Yeah, yeah, But, um, it's... Mum's sitting there shaking it. She's like, oh, my God, too much information. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but, you know, products that come out or people that are in different aspects of the adult industry, I don't have no filter. I'm very liberal now mm. because I've lived a very dark, jaded, very quick, fast forward of all the... Because you're only 27. <laughs> you go He's 27 it. and he's lived that <laughs> life. And, you know, the thing that made me happy, like when we're talking about um, you and your career and whatever, and like... Can we mention who your current client is that you're working with? Which ones? The big ones. Yeah, the big yeah. one that you're doing now. Like yeah. So I don't know if I'm allowed to. Pro probably not. I, I really want to. It's like when you know you ask celebrities on TV shows, "What are you do next?" Oh, there may be this. Um, there are festivals and events all over the world and in Australia that focus on the adult industry. Sweet Release has been around for about a, just over a year. It was going on when I was going through all the crap. Um, I can't mention the name of the business, okay, all right. but that's, that's enough of an insight as to that. My You'll see it advertised very shortly, yeah. like it happens every year. Yeah, everywhere around different cities. And yeah, the world. all around the world, um, it happens every year, and it's to do with the adult industry. Yeah. And, and I think that's a really good clue. That's enough. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but yeah, Sweet Release is PR and advertising and marketing and business strategy for adult businesses that generally get a bad rap, like escorts do. Mm -hmm. Like people like me have got bad raps out there because I didn't know who I was and I was so affected by different shit that I lost myself. And it's, yeah, businesses out there cop that all the time in any industry, really. But adult industry is extremely competitive and people rely on mainstream, what they believe is mainstream services to help them and people that have no connection to this industry have a hard time understanding it and selling it or promoting it or branding it because they just go, oh yeah, sex sells. It doesn't. Mm. In an industry that is all about sex, sex don't sell.
they're much more firm and all about their business. They're more strict around guidelines than I've ever experienced before, um, which is great because they know what they want. And it's so easy to work with them, whereas most mainstream, which I'm hoping one day, which is why my business exists, to put every industry under this umbrella of mainstream, there shouldn't be adult retail, adult hospital. Like it shouldn't be separated. It's For me, it's a business and a product doing something for humans. If it's there, mm. and it's a business and a brand, and my job as a marketing person or an advertising person, lucky thing is I've got the experience there, which is great, and again, sweet release, you're the only one that does in Australia. We're the only brand. But we'll see, it. we'll see but sweet release attached to this certain Yeah, world. and yeah. It's, it's interesting to have that connection. Let's hold that board up because yeah. I want to show people. Um, oh. Okay, so <coughs> mum needed to talk then. Sorry about that. Yeah. So can you, have, can you have a look on the... Oh. Um, can you have a look on there or, oh, and yeah, just yeah. see if, yeah. you don't have to move, we'll you move the picture. Oh, good. Can everyone see that? How about that? <laughs> like, it's almost the same as my hair braiding. Yeah. <laughs> you know, like, hey, <laughs> if I didn't know any really better, that. I'd say yeah. I copied off you. <laughs> I'm inspired your hair. <laughs> Um, yeah, no, there's some even some so you would have seen, there. And you'll even see, um, I've like this one here, so they know it's you'll even amazing. see, um, the spelling charismatic there. Very oh, clever, yeah, okay. very clever. Like, you'll see that in the picture that we put up as mum standing out there trying not to cough. <laughs> but you know, we're just going to put that there and sit back here. Yeah. So, there's some photos on there from when we first met. Oh, it's really? the Matara <coughs> Festival. Oh, yeah. After, because we met at the fashions of Beaumont or Beaumont Fashion. Yes, see? And then, so much of my life gets crammed into one day that that may only be quite a few years down the track, but there's probably about 50 years of stuff crammed into all those days. Yes, yeah. You know, a bit like you, but, mm. you know, <laughs> I'm the heterosexual, remember? Yeah. yeah. With my so, hair. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> With charismatic hair. <laughs> and yours is more pink. Yeah. But, um, I'm getting a new wig now. Oh, good. We're going for red. Well, I'm thinking maybe what we can do is we can get you, um, we can get you back in drag and do a show. Okay. And let, we'll just do the, the whole concentration on that show and, you know, how you bring it together and your costumes and okay. your makeup and yeah. everything like that. Like, very different to this So one. look at him now. <laughs> And when he returns as charismatic, you, honestly, you'll just go, wow, I love the eyelash, love the makeup, love the dress, love everything about you. Like, yeah, a lot of us women just stare back and go, wow, doesn't he look fantastic? It's so unfair. Oh. You know, so maybe you can give some hot tips on eyelashes and eye makeup or something. Yeah, and, and not to use bronzer as a contour, use eyeshadow. eyeshadow. Oh, there's a hot tip. Eyeshadow, use your eyeshadows. And if you're going to try and make yourself stand out with your cheekbones, do the opposite colour. Don't paint yourself, and I know it sounds counterintuitive because if you're wearing a dress with <coughs> straps and not a thing, but if you're wearing an outfit that covers your neckline, use a darker makeup, slightly darker, and use your skin tone as your highlight. Less makeup is required for that, and you have to run on those crappy powders that crack. So your foundations or your eyeshadows, just dust that stuff on. And but there's a hot tip! But we won't have that as your message of hope today. No. We're, we're, coming to an, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we're coming to an end and, um, you know, each and every week when I have someone on the show and mm. I ask my guests if they would give a message of hope to someone because, yeah. you know, there'd be someone out there that's either going through a similar situation that you've gone through, mm. in the middle of it right now, or even, you know, trying to work out where they are with their sexuality right now or even just wondering whether I should tell my parents. Mm. You know, so... So even that one, even that last point, like I wouldn't give anyone a hope, hope from, like if you don't think your parents are going to accept that one and in your heart, don't do it because there's, there's more damage that can come out of that. I think there's three messages here really because I've gone through a lot of stuff. All right, okay, three. so... You get we'll, three. We'll give, we'll give him five minutes. Oh no, less than five. <laughs> we'll give him three minutes <laughs> three. to get these three okay. messages out. So yeah. this is your message of hope to someone out there that's in a similar so situation as you. Yeah. 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 Um, okay. yeah, so I think when it comes to your self-identity, identity is important. Because when you're growing up, 
or wherever you are in life, whatever stage it might be, identity is important. It was important for me. Um, not knowing who I was or who I wanted to be, everyone goes through that. Um, be true to who you are and don't let people tell you who you should be. Uh, that's one thing I made a huge, huge mistake with and my parents and family and friends like Kelly have never told me to be anyone other than myself. Um, be who you are and we love you and for who you are and what you want to be, you do you. Don't let anyone tell you who you is. You be you. That's one of the, one of the biggest messages I can give. When it comes to experimentation, I was never really forced, well I was in the end, but I was never really forced or pressured to use drugs. I experimented and then it became forced. If you have friends out there or you're even using drugs and you're not sure about it, some people have their vices, people drink, people do drugs, every, every alcohol is a drug. So it's your interpretation of it. Um, my message there would be if you're unsure about it or you're scared about it or you're worried about what it might be, what it might cause, what it could lead to in your future, ask questions. There's so many resources online. There are Counselling services, which I kind of wish I accessed a lot earlier on, drug and alcohol counsellors, some of them are free, and if you can't get them free, go to your GP. Go to a GP mm. and go, hey, I want 10 free sessions. You're entitled to that. And in those sessions, ask those questions with someone that knows what they're talking about. Don't do what I did and assume that if you ask a drug addict <laughs> about it, they're going to tell you, oh, yeah, it's fine. It's, it's, it, mm. For them, for maybe for them it is, but for you, if you're unsure, don't. Don't do it because I lived it and I would it would kill me to see someone else go through what I went through or hear that knowing that they've seen this. Um, mm. If you've seen this video, don't copy me. Mm. <laughs> so be you. Um, I guess the third one is, is to absorb as much as you can in life because I did it too quickly. I feel 40, 50 in the head, which is nuts. Um, and that's what's led me to meet some really amazing people. But with life, take it easy. I think that's the message. Like, don't get caught up in what people say you should be and let that guide what you do in life because mm. that's what ends up tripping you up and then you go through a really crazy roller coaster that leads you to the light bulb moments of, <laughs> shit, who am I? Who do I want to be? And you want to make that realisation as you go and not get heavily pushed in any direction. So, yeah, messages are, uh, be you. Don't feel like you're alone because there are resources mm -hmm. out there that I have found along, along the way, probably at the last minute. Um, but they are there. There are resources, there are counsellors. I'm still seeing a psychologist now because it helps me to see someone and, and talk through things because there are a lot of PTSD that are still sitting there that I have to deal with. and certain trigger points for me, don't let the trigger points trip you up. If you see something that's making you feel uncomfortable, write it down, talk about it. Mm. Or and that's walk, the thing. Away. <laughs> walk away, walk well, away, there's negative, get away from it. That's the thing that I try, well, that I encourage, you know, to find someone to talk to. That's the biggest thing. Mm. That's the first step, is to talk to someone about it. If you don't know what to do about it, talk to someone about it. Mm. And they will guide you and assist you to find the right people to speak with. You know, in life, you know, it's about communication and communication is the key and I say this every week because that's what I believe in. You know, it's no use keeping all this stuff inside you. Release it. Speak to someone about it because in life that can lead to assistance and guidance in other areas mm. that can help you so much in life. And, you know, it's only the beginning. So, you know, I just, look, I just want everyone to know that no matter what in life, don't give up. No, don't. Do don't not you. give up. Brayden could have given up. Oh, I could have given so up. So many points I could have given up. Even to the last one, you said about kids that are maybe, maybe feeling that they're same-sex oriented like I am. If you're, if you're confused about that, there are people for you too. Mm. There are groups in Sydney, groups in Newcastle even. There are groups all over Australia and the world. And there are counsellors for that. And if you need to find a group, if you're underage, there's companies like 2010, for example. Look it up. Um, they have groups for, for young kids that are below the age of 18 that can experiment, well, not experiment this really, but they can ask questions and be supported. There's, if your family is confused about your sexuality because you know you're gay, check out PFLAG. 
parents of friends of lesbians and gays. And wow, there's that's an great information. There's an organ. I was just thinking now, which ones did I end up? Because charismatic story. Charismatic was an ambassador for P Flag in the Mardi Gras in March. She marched. <laughs> she marched in, Mar in the Mardi Gras um, as ambassador for that. So check it out because parents and friends or P Flag, parents, friends, lesbians, gays. Um, that's an organisation for, I guess, to help parents understand what it means to have a child that's gay. And I know that sounds stupid. And charismatic is um, a why I'm racist soon. Why I'm, yeah. yeah in why I'm 1st racist. of September. So, you know, get yourself along to there for people that are local in that situation. But, you know, like, mm -hmm. I just wanted to say, like I say every week, no matter what in life, do not give up. Mm -hmm. Know that you are going to be okay. So we can do a thumbs up, right? Yeah. Let's do the thumbs up and we'll sign off on today and okay. know that no matter what, you're going to be okay. We're going to be okay. <laughs>